Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them thoroughly to your children, and you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes, and you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Y'all know those words from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. In fact, honestly, I know it better in Hebrew than in English. Because from a young age, I just grew up singing that a, a little song that goes with that. And that's I'd, long before I had any idea what it meant. That was a part of everything that I knew about who I was. And, and, it, and it goes on. And, and, but that passage, it, it's so inculcated in the Jewish belief. If you go to a Jewish house, you'll see a little, a little sign on the doorpost, right? And it's, it's, this little, it's this little container. It's called a mezuzah. And that mezuzah will be at a 45-degree angle. And it will contain that passage. And it will also contain Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 26, which goes on and says more, uh, more about what, how to obey his commandments and how to bind his commandments. Because it says you will have this when you will repeat this when you're laying down and waking up. So it's at a 45 degree angle between laying down and waking up. And it says bind it upon the doorpost. So it's put on the doorpost. But it's also. Jewish men over the age of 13 will wear these. These are called tefillin. Uh, sometimes you'll hear, hear them referred to as Jewish olfactories, which I'm not even sure what that word means. But, but we called it tefillin. And honestly, I wanted to bring mine in today and demonstrate for you. But there were two problems. One is you're not supposed to do it on Sabbath. But the bigger problem is I couldn't find them. So... I have them someplace. But these inside these boxes is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 and Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 26. And the reason you have these is what you do is you bind one on your head right here and one on your hand and it winds around. And the reason is it says that you will bind these as a sign upon your hand and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes. So this is a very literal interpretation of the passage, you take the words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you put it everywhere where he told you to. So Jew, observant Jews will do this every single day except Sabbath. And they'll bind it, especially this current week, right? because we're in the week between the New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's when we're supposed to do more and more and more stuff for God so that he forgets all the bad stuff that we did and forgives us on the Day of Atonement so we can trick him into forgiving us on the one day that the gates to heaven are open. That, that, that really is kind of the idea. And then, so Day of Atonement starts tomorrow at sundown, and it's all day Monday, and you don't eat anything because you're going to come close to God. Now, of course, we know as Christians, the gates to heaven are always open, Right? And he's always pouring his forgiveness out from them. But I get aside. So you bind this. Oh, we're one ahead there. I bumped it. So you bind this on your head and on your hand. So Israeli soldiers, those that are observant, will do this as they're preparing in the morning. And they'll do their morning prayers. And they'll eat their breakfast. And they'll, they'll wear their tefillin. So the, there were Israeli soldiers that were doing this in the morning. And they were binding and while they were they were at the bottom of a valley and there was a group of of the other side that was uh planning a surprise attack so they came down the hill and they were kind of hiding in the bushes just just seeing and spying and seeing what it would look like and if they were going to be able to to take them out in the surprise attack and what they saw was these jewish men putting these boxes on their head and on their hand and they kind of, and, and chanting in Hebrew. And they kind of freaked out. And they went there to their commanders and said, we can't attack. They, they've got some kind of weird weapon that they're putting on their bodies and they're willing to blow themselves up to take us out. The surprise attack never happened. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your scripture. Thank you for your word. 
Thank you for your servant, Paul, who brought us Ephesians. Today, open Ephesians up to us so that we may hear your words, not mine, and we may see you, and we may grow closer to you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So we've been in Ephesians for a while now, right? And we're, we're getting, this the last two weeks of Ephesians here. And this is the last, really, in, in moving forward through Ephesians. Next week, we're going to kind of go back and give you more of an overview. So it's, this is almost the conclusion of Ephesians. So it's, it's kind of where we've all been going to. And as we look at it, I want us to think about this image. All right, we've... We, Two weeks ago, we covered the, the full armor of God and where we're fitting in today. Where we're fitting in today at, 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 um, at Ephesians 6, uh, 18 to 20 is right at the end of the full armor of God. So after we describe everything that the Christian soldier's wearing, we say, praying at all times in the spirit with every prayer and every request and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints pray also for me that the message may be given to me when i open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for this i am an ambassador in chains pray that i might be bold enough in him to speak as i should so we wage peace it says the, the Sabbath school quarterly today, its, its title was Wage Peace, that, that Paul is actively waging a battle of peace. And it, it got me thinking of this, this image from uh, September 30th, 1938. That's Neville Chamberlain. And he says, my good friends, for the second time in history, a British prime minister has returned from Germany, bringing peace with honor. I believe it is peace for our time. Go home and get a good, quiet Nice sleep on September 30th, 1938. I think you may have miscalculated. Throughout history, it's not hundreds, it's thousands of times that world leaders have de declared we have peace. And every time they, have, they declare we have peace, the world kind of erupts into chaos and peace does not follow, right? I often think that when world leaders say the word peace, they don't spell it P-E-A-C-E. -E. They spell it P-I-E-C-E. -E. They don't want world peace, but they want a peace of everything in the world. All right? And so we have, we have this, this concept of peace, this idea out there of peace, but we don't really have a clear view of what is peace peace and what is it that we're aiming for when we say that word peace in hebrew we've got the word shalom it's a, it's a catch-all word it means all sorts of things you say to somebody you say hello you say shalom you say goodbye you say shalom you say happy sabbath is shabbat shalom right everything is shalom but, but it's it's true meaning is peace but it's not peace like let's stop fighting it's it's a totally different concept it's an all-consuming living in peace right but but in our modern society we have the idea that that there's, there's kind of a warrior, and a warrior is somebody who, who goes to battle, right? Our soldier. And then there's the pacifist on the other end. That's the one who's against war at all. But, but do we have another a third that's maybe like a, a peacemaker, right? Somebody who's, who's maybe not really a warrior and not really a pacifist, or maybe really is a warrior and really is a pacifist, but he's somewhere in the middle. He's, he's the peacemaker, I think the best example we have of this is somebody who should be familiar to everybody within our denomination for sure. Desmond Doss. Right? There was a movie made about him that was, that was huge, right? Just a few years ago. Very mainstream film. On the uh, Hacksaw Ridge, on the, on, on the story of Desmond Doss, a man who was a warrior to the bone, fought with everything he could without ever lifting a weapon, without ever fighting, always putting his life on the line, becoming a soldier that soldiers looked up to and respected without having any of the outward trappings that we normally put with a soldier. He simply, without protection, except for the protection we all carry when we pray to, to Christ, walked into the dangerous of danger zones and walked out with his fellow soldiers, carrying them. You know, we did a vendor fair 
just a couple of weeks ago. And one of the vendors that came is uh, they, they sell oils, uh, like essential oils. And, and they actually brought a bunch of the other uh, vendors there. And when, when I was talking to them, they said they absolutely love the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Really? What is it that you love about the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, all we know is we saw Hacksaw Ridge, and that guy, Desmond Doss, is amazing. Right? It, that, that's how the, the world says They may know no, nothing about us, but that guy is somebody to, to emulate, to look up to, to respect, and to think about. And, and you can't really call him a pacifist. Right? It's not a man who was, who was against battle. It's a man who fought as a warrior for peace. Which brings me to the problem that I had grow, as a young adult and as, as an adult in my 20s and even into the early 30s. I had a problem with this Jesus fellow. I did. See, I was taught that the Messiah would come. And when the Messiah came, he would bring with him peace. And hey, Christmas comes around and all the Christians sing about the Prince of Peace and the bringer of peace and how he brings peace. And every time I look at the newspaper, there's no peace. If he's the Prince of Peace, where's the peace? Right? And this was a big problem I had with this Prince of Peace. How could he be the Messiah if the Messiah was going to bring in peace and there was no peace? How could there be, how could he be the one? How could there be a Messiah until we have peace? But we have warriors who fight battles and yet they're warriors for the concept of peace. And if we have a warrior who can fight for peace, can we have peace when it appears that we do not have peace around us? Can we truly have a warrior who is a warrior who fights for peace? And I would present to you that we have a church of warriors who fight for peace. I have two names for you. We have a group called the Prayer Warriors. Now, they exist within our church here and adjacent to our church here. And they literally, their name is Prayer Warriors. They fight for peace. They are warriors who fight through one method and that is the battle of prayer itself and let me tell you if you're engaged in the battle of prayer it ain't safe it's not without risk it is a way of going almost unarmed into the darkness of battle right because you're fighting against principalities you cannot see it is fighting against the unseen. And the prayer warriors go deep into that battle. We also, right here, every Wednesday night, we have prayer night, which is literally getting, getting out and fighting for peace for our community. With the only weapon being my Lord Jesus. Right? And, and, and that's, of course, gotten people into trouble in the past. If you read the, the Old Testament, you go through 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, a whole lot of stories of people carrying around this box that they thought God was in, right? And so they thought they could go into every battle just carrying God with them and they'd be safe. You can't just carry God with you into battle. You've got to be in him in battle. So the statement, waging peace, then becomes almost our closing statement of Ephesians. You see, what we have here is we have this passage of Ephesians that starts with the full armor of God and concludes into a word of prayer. Right? Here's what it says, Ephesians 6, starting in 6.10. Finally, so it's the end, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. We're not going to read about our battles in the newspaper. Our battles are not battles fought between countries. They're not about physical wars. It is a spiritual battle. And it says, this is why you must take up the full armor of God. If you have on the full armor of God and you walk into, into a physical battlefield, 
it's not the armor that you would be that would necessarily be what's selected for you. That armor is the armor to bring into the spiritual battle, the battle against the unseen forces. That, ba- that, that spiritual armor we cover ourselves with, the full armor of God, so that we can resist in the evil day, having prepared everything to take our stand. Not some things, but everything to take our stand. So we stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, Take the shield of faith and able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. And pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. The purpose for the full armor of God is to push us onto our knees. We wear the armor to go into prayer. We, get, we, we clothe ourselves in battle gear to go into prayer. It's the idea of going into war as a warrior peacemaker. And we travel into that war for one purpose. See, and this is the closing statement to Ephesians. Take a look at Ephesians. There's an argument being laid out in Ephesians here. All right, so we we start with Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, which says, Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favor and will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he favored us with in the beloved. Right? So I think this is kind of almost a thesis statement that, that uh, Paul is making here. He's saying, praise God who chose us to have every spiritual blessing. Who did God choose to have every spiritual blessing? <coughs> Raise your hand if he chose you to have every spiritual blessing. All right. Is there anybody who is left out of that choice? Is there anybody who God has not chosen to have that spiritual blessing? What about somebody who doesn't come to church? Has they been chosen to have that spiritual blessing? What about somebody who doesn't know Jesus? Have they been chosen to have that spiritual blessing? Take your page out of the newspaper and look at the worst headline you can imagine. That person in there, has he been chosen to have every spiritual blessing? Absolutely. God has chosen every person to have his spiritual blessing. And he chose them before the foundation of the world. We get, we get caught up in this. In love, he predestined us to be adopted. Because we think, oh, that means that some people are, have been chosen. And people who are going to walk away from God is because God didn't pre-choose them at the beginning of time. No, God chose everybody to be predestined to be with him. He chose everybody to walk with him. He chose everybody to receive his spiritual blessing. Right, and that's, that's Paul's big thesis statement. And from it, he then goes and he prays for the Ephesians. And then he gives this message that God is sovereign and the world submits to Christ. Then he tells us that it's only through Christ that we are brought to life. There's no distinctions, no differences, no separations in him. Everybody is at an equal level. Everybody is fallen and in need of grace and has been given that grace through Christ alone. Then the church works together to be imitators of Christ. What does that mean? That means that we don't see distinctions in people either. We see everybody as, as living in the grace of Christ himself. We see everybody as sitting at, at the foot of the cross. I wanted to make a t-shirt once that had a picture of the cross and a little arrow at the bottom and say, wish you were here. Right. Arrow at the bottom, right there at the foot of the cross. But it says... He sees us all as being at that foot of the cross, all deserving of that that spiritual blessing. And then he tells us, go out and be seen as Christians. What does that mean? Be seen as people who love everybody without distinction, who thinks everybody deserves to be with Christ. And then he says, live a life of submission in the way Christ lived a life of submission. And that's his whole argument. And then he says, here's my closing statement. 
be a warrior of Christ. Put on the full armor and fight for the peace of Christ. So if we're warriors of Christ, and Christ is the Prince of Peace, it follows that we are warriors of peace. So we have a job to do. We are tasked to win the war. So we have to know first, we're in a war. And it's really easy to try and pretend that we're not. We're not going to see, hopefully, bombs fall through the, the roof of the church. Right? We're, we're here in America. We're, we're pretty much protected. Right? We're allowed to have this meeting. We could go out and have this same church meeting out on the street corner. Right? We can proclaim Christ just about anywhere. I can tell you, I proclaimed Christ right there at Disneyland in the middle of uh, the middle of the the on stage with my costume on while I'm on the clock. You can preach Christ wherever you want in America. People might think think differently of you, but you can do it. You aren't going to be arrested for it. You're not going to be killed for it. The same is not true throughout the world. But over here, it's easy to think we're not in a war. And if we think that the battle, when it talks about us being in a battle, and a battle against things that are unseen, it's easy to begin looking at headlines and thinking, I don't like what that person's doing, and therefore that must be the battle that we're talking about. Or I don't like what that person's doing. I don't like what that person's saying about it. I don't like this president. I don't like that senator. Therefore, that must be the unseen battle. And, and the way I defend Christ is by yelling about my political views or yelling about how this person isn't, isn't good enough for Christ. But, but the spiritual battle that Paul is talking about, the spiritual battle that Jesus is asking us to prepare for, to get girded for, to have our armor for, that spiritual battle is a battle for peace. So that means it can't really be about putting somebody else down for, for whatever it is that's bothering us about them. It must be for something different. That spiritual battle. Let's take a look at Philippians. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 says, Rejoice. And I like rejoice because if it's peaceful, we've got to have some rejoicing, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I, I already, this is a great passage for me because it says rejoice twice. I'm good, let's party. And, but it says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if we're in him, then we have a peace that surpasses all understanding so much that it guards everything we see and do. Well, that's an incredible amount of peace, right? It's great for us to hold it on to ourselves and be so excited we have it, doesn't it? Isn't it? So, Judaism that I was born and raised in was given a message of God. God's sovereignty, God's love for the world. And told, go and tell the world about it. And the response, by and large, was, at this awesome God that we have for us and he loves us and he's for us and we're going to hold on to him and a whole lot of the battle we see in the New Testament is the, the one side saying it's for us stop sharing it and the other side saying no it's for everybody and uh, the other side happens to be God himself saying no it's for everybody start sharing it and, and we look at it and we begin to say this peace we're battling for peace so that we can have peace for us and we fight this battle to bring this peace, this shalom into us so that we can be covered in peace. We're not battling for our peace. We're not battling so that we can have peace. God didn't ask us to bathe in peace. He said he'll provide peace. He asked us to be the warriors of peace for the world. Our purpose isn't to have 
our peace, but to spread his peace. We fight a battle so that every person that we interact with can feel the peace of Christ. Not so that we can bathe in it, hold on to it, and say, what a great thing he's given to us. Let's hold it and keep it. Let's keep it in this church. Let's make sure we don't talk about it outside those doors because we don't want anybody else to start sharing this because maybe that's going to lessen the peace that I have. No, we're supposed to go out there. And you know what? We're supposed to go out there as warriors. And what is the risk to a warrior? A warrior is willing to risk everything. When Desmond Doss went into battle, he didn't know he was going to make it out alive. When you go into battle, you don't know whether you're going to make it out alive. I was asked early on being here, we are having a conversation that was a little bit political. And the, the conversation turned around the idea of guns. And I said, I, I would never feel comfortable holding a gun myself. I said, because I think if I'm holding a gun myself, it means that I'm willing to take somebody else's life with it. And the person I was talking to said, well, what about if your life was in danger? And I said, I don't think I'm ready to say that my life is worth more than yours. And so I'm not willing to, I'm not putting down people who are, I'm just saying for me, I'm not willing to say that my safety is worth more than your safety. And he asked the big question, he said, what about your family? It's a little tougher then, doesn't it? Jesus said, can't be my followers until you hate your family. He didn't mean hate your family. Not one part of him did. But he said, love me so much that I blind you to everything else. You know what? If it takes a sacrifice of my child to reach somebody else, it'll hurt me like heck but I pray that God gives me the strength to do it. If it takes me risking my life, the life of somebody I love, the life of any of you, God didn't ask us to be safe. God asked us to go into battle. And sometimes that battle is going to hurt. And everybody in this church today has battle scars, recent battle scars. We've all lost people on the battlefield. And it hurts. And it hurts an awful lot. But we're in a battle to wage peace throughout the world. And maybe, maybe some of those battle scars we've felt out on the battlefield have meant that the kingdom has grown. And as hard as that's been for us, maybe somebody's walking with him because of the battle scars that we've endured. And we're going to endure more. And the worst sorrow you've already had in your life, it's going to get worse. I'm sorry. I know that's hard to hear. This is a lot of us have lost a lot. But peace costs everything. And when that peace is to cover the world, is to bring his peace to every person in the world. Whatever the cost, isn't it worth it? Today, as we not only get to the end of Ephesians, we're also at the end of a month. It's a very difficult month. This month has been set aside by the mental health community as a month to be aware of the idea of suicide, suicidal thoughts, and depression. I was asked this week, actually somebody I didn't remember having ever met before, says to me, Pastor Jeff, I've been waiting to see you again. Really? I, okay. It was good to see you. And she said, I want to know, Jeff, if somebody takes their own life, are they in heaven? Can they still go to heaven or are they banned forever? She said, I was told, she said she had been in the military and a friend of hers had 
gotten taken so much pain from what they had seen that when they came back, they couldn't go back into regular life and eventually they took their own life. So I want to know if my friend, if they're banned from heaven because they took their own life. And I said to her, I love a God who loves every person. I love a God who doesn't judge the individual actions we take but judges the fact that you are created in His image. And when He sees you, He doesn't see the totality of the things you've done, but He sees His Son's face. I said, we bathe in the forgiveness of a God that is so huge, it spills out onto all of us, even though we don't, not one of us deserves it. So how would a God who is so huge that he's forgiven all the immensity of what I've done not forgive this one thing because your friend was bearing so much pain from battling for others. Folks, today we go into battle. And today we will will obtain pain in that battle. She looked at me and she said, Thanks for bringing me peace. We go into battle. Can we bring somebody peace? Can we battle to bring peace to every person we meet? That is the answer to my childhood. How can we say this is the peace bringer, the prince of peace, when we still have war? It's because he was somebody who was willing to lose his life to bring you into his peace. Now let's do the same for everybody else. Let's pray. Dear God, put me on the board as a warrior for you. Put everybody here into play and help us battle your battle in order to bring you to everyone that we meet so that your peace can cover everyone and so that we can join together at your banquet table praising you for having predestined everyone to be there in your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. As we sing this next song, although it may be new, may its message not only bring peace over us all, but also remind us of the great love of God that can conquer any battle. So let's stand and sing.
God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Oh, 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 oh. Swing wide, all you haven't. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children. Clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven. For this battle that we've been talking about, are you all prayed up? Uh, I have a, I have an announcement that I forgot, and I'm going to tie it into that. Okay. Because there's there's a method that our denomination has picked as one of the ways of developing warriors for peace. And that is called uh, Pathfinders. Oh, and that's right, literally right. what it was created for, is developing the Warriors for Peace. I passed out surveys a couple weeks ago, and we got a scattering back, a few back. I really want to launch a Pathfinder Club here. I really do, which is a huge step for me because it's never been my thing. <laughs> it's okay. You can wear but, a uniform. But I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, but I need help. Um, the people that are willing to help me uh, get this launched are only willing to do that if we have yeah. enough help to we actually help. do it yeah. and to do it right. I don't want to do it part way. I want to do it right. Uh, so I have more of those surveys in the very back. Really, all I'm looking to know is, are you willing to help? And if, if you are, put yes on there, put your name, a phone number, or an email. And I'm going to touch base with everybody this week to, make, to put a planning meeting together so we can plan on launching in October. Uh, but I really, really would like to be able to do this. I think this is a way to really help reach this community and to wage peace. Amen. Amen. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we, as we uh, ask God's presence to be with us. Father, the scripture says that we are to pray about everything. And that our method is that we bring things to you. That is, our, that is the way in which we are to spread the kingdom, the kingdom of peace. And so, Father, I'd like to ask that whatever might be upon our hearts at this moment that is uh, weighing on us, that we would bring those before you, hear those prayer requests. There are others of people that we know that are also dealing with issues and we invite you to enter into those lives as well. And let it be that when we enter a house that, that peace is what is left whenever we come into the presence of others. So now this week, as we move from moment to moment, let it be that your peace is what we is what we bring and let us be always connected to you prayers and supplications let it be that that we experience more fully 
that presence of God as we bring these things to you. Thank you so much, Father. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, outside, we want to celebrate birthdays. So there is a table, reception table outside. There is shave ice. There is uh, just a, a whole birthday amazing celebration just outside. Let's fellowship together and let's enjoy. And please, um, as, they, as they have shave ice together, you've got all kinds of different flavors to make the day even more spectacular and, and tasting joyful. So amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone.